This is comfy. So, are A-level grades crucial? No, no, they're not. Is your personal statement really that important? How have I gotten to Oxford University Engineering without being a maths and physics genius? My advice and some hot takes. What's up, guys? My name is Bartle, if you're new here. And welcome to the long-awaited video, at least I feel it's long-awaited, video on how to get into Oxford, the things I did, my advice, all the good stuff. So since I made my Oxford video where I talk about was it worth studying there for four years, I'll probably be making some more Oxford slash engineering videos in the future. But let me know in the comments below what you would like to see in these videos. Naturally, the most highly requested video I've had since then is... Welcome to that video. All right, so today I'm going to talk about how I was admitted into Oxford and how you can be too or at least some things to improve your chances, unfortunate truths, and my overall personal experience, plus some hot takes with Bartle. So stay tuned until the end. I feel like it's important for me to say, no, I'm not an admissions officer, and neither are you probably, but I have done a lot of research and I've looked at a lot of stats, as I'm sure many of you, if you're watching this video, have. So I'm gonna try and keep it as evidence-based as possible, instead of pretending like I have all the answers, because that wouldn't be as helpful. All right, so first thing for my international students, for my older, younger audience, or just those who don't know, Oxford is quite a specific university. For engineering, at least, it's the only university other than Cambridge in the UK that requires an admissions exam. And only one of three, the others being Cambridge and Imperial, to require admissions interviews as well. For all others, you just need your UCAS personal statement and A-level predicted grades or equivalent grades. So the best way for me to showcase the entire process is to walk you through what and how I did everything. And maybe you can learn from this, plus just some advice, insights, and maybe some hot takes that I might have for them. If you like the sound of this, the first step is for me to ask you guys to just kindly hit that like button before I forget. I would much appreciate it, and it helps me continue making these insightful, hopefully, videos. All right, so predicted grades. So for engineering, Oxford cares about your entire education, so it looks at both your GCSEs and your A-level scores. If you're not applying from the UK, then it will be the equivalent, so all your exams since you were 16, pretty much. And they look at all of these contextually. Well, what does this mean? It means that they take into account your exam results relative to how good of a school you went to, so their quality of teaching and also a number of other things like the area you live in, your household income, if you're a first-generation student, whether you're a primary carer, basically anything that could have held you back from focusing on school, they will look at and they know, which is very helpful and fair of them. So for me, my GCSE secondary school was not ranked as very good, and Oxford knew and took this into consideration when I applied. And then when I switched schools for A-levels, they also knew that, and they took that into consideration. Now, our GCSE grade is important. Well, yes and no. Technically, Oxford wants to know if you are on the level academically they need for you to keep up in lectures, and that's it. So their main requirement is solid A-level predictions. They want to see A star, A star, A, including maths and physics, with the A stars being in maths, physics, or further maths. And this means that you don't need further maths, but it is really helpful, as you will have to know most of that content anyway by the end of your first year at Oxford. But again, it's not mandatory. So I took maths, further maths, physics, and chemistry, and was predicted four A stars going into the admissions process, just for context. It's not required to do four A levels, and not necessary, but I was just a massive nerd and liked all these subjects. It's good to have just the three, and then you can focus completely on them, but one thing I will say is doing four A levels definitely got me accustomed to the amount of work at Oxford before even going there. Well, to be honest, nothing can really get you accustomed to that, but anyways, it helped a little bit. Now, A levels are the important ones, so focus on these, but good GCSEs definitely help show you've had a consistently good level of education. But there are no requirements on this, so you don't need to stress about them too much. Okay, so you will have your A level predictions. You're doing at least maths and physics at A level, maybe even further maths if you're really boring. But now it comes time for the personal statement. So it was the summer between your 12 and 13, and I had to sit down while the sun was shining outside on a small island in Croatia, with my grandma screaming from the kitchen, and in 4,000 characters, I had to show my passion for engineering. Well, I didn't even know what engineering was at that point. I just knew I liked maths and physics, but didn't like each of them enough individually, but I couldn't write that down. Well, if you want some more advice on how to write a personal statement, I will link my video where I explain just about everything you need to write a banging personal statement over here. But essentially, the main points for your personal statement is to A, have an attention-grabbing introduction, as admissions examiners read thousands of these. Then have great maths and physics paragraphs, which showcase how you went beyond A-level knowledge to find answers for just your own personal curiosities you might have, and doing this using great resources like books or online lectures. And then you'll also need a project paragraph, which I talk more about in the video. And finally, a great conclusion, which sums up your passions for engineering and gives an overall tone of competence and academic brilliance to your personal statement, while also showcasing some of your extracurriculars, which shows you're not a complete robot and have other hobbies and interests apart from school. Anyway, there's more of that in the video, but this was just a little summary. Also, what I do if I was you and is what I did, I would recommend, of course, 
having a few people that you're very close to proofread your essay. I'd ask your parents, siblings, whoever. But perhaps more importantly, I would ask someone who's not quite as close to you, someone who's not in the inner circle, someone who's not emotionally invested. It might give you a more objective perspective. For me, this was my head of year when you would be brutally honest with me and I really valued and trusted your advice. So yeah, I'd recommend asking a few people, but at the same time, I would not want you to get too many cooks in the kitchen because at some point you can just get advice that kind of holds you back and just goes round in circles. So I recommend picking a few people who will give good, honest feedback. Now for the admissions exam, Oxford has an admissions exam called the PAT, the Physics Aptitude Test, which all students applying for engineering and physics need to take in the autumn of year 13. And this exam is aimed at a level which can be solved by a 16 year old, but we all know they make it very tricky and sneaky. What I did notice when preparing though, is that it very closely follows the UK syllabus for GCSE and some A-level stuff. And so if you're an international student, take a look at GCSE and A-level maths and physics to familiarize yourself with the topics that might come up. But basically the exam has two parts. One part is a multiple choice part and the other is a long form question part and they give you two hours to complete it. The main issue I had that you might encounter is that there is not much time to complete all of it and that your scores might not be as good as you're used to. When I first tried it, I nearly gave up, but two things on this. A, you don't need to finish the whole paper and B, this is much different to school and you're not really meant to be getting close to 100% on this unless you're freaking Albert Einstein or something. Well, not really, but kind of. So yeah, don't be discouraged by the questions. The uni actually suggests an average mark, which gets you an interview, something between 50 and 60. And for me, I practiced past papers all summer leading up to the exam. As with anything, practice gets you good at the exam. You just have to learn the types of questions that they ask. Let's just pause here for a second. We talked about the A-level predicted grades. We talked about the personal statement and now the path admissions exam. And despite me saying that if you prepare well, you will do well, I just want to stress that this is not meant to be easy. What I haven't mentioned is that in my case, despite having perfect GCC results and four A stars predicted at A-level, as well as a really good admissions exam, which obviously I didn't know at that point, it was very tough to get to that point. I used to train swimming six times a week. I trained football four times a week. And in preparation for my application year, I actually dropped one of the sports, which was football, to be able to handle the entire process. I don't want to scare you away but by this, but I'm saying that if you want to commit 100% to the process, it will take sacrifice. And in some cases, like in my case, a lot of it. Some people just waltz into Oxford and it's super simple, but that definitely wasn't me and that may as well not be you. So just be prepared for the sacrifices, but also enjoy the entire process and learn from it. It's a great character builder at every step of the way. At the same time, I know people who say that each step of the process is really just to check a box. And in some ways it is, but it doesn't imply that each step or any of the steps of the process are easy and can be glanced over. I would be very wary of framing it in this way because I could see applicants thinking, well, my grades, my test scores, they're pretty good. Like they'll check the box. Well, I showed you just how good they actually have to be to check that box in some cases. So don't sleep on your grades and test scores because ideally you would want to fall into a safe range in order to statistically have a higher probability of getting in. Sorry for that interlude, I just felt I had to stress this message and keep it as positive and encouraging as possible but still quite realistic. Okay now, back to the real video. Before we get into the interview stage of the process, I want to talk a little bit about extracurriculars and this is not only so you can mention them in your personal statement but also just advice for general school life if you're watching this and have some free time. School is always one aspect of life growing up, but you do as much learning, if not more, if you take on a job, do some volunteering on the weekends, or play sports or play an instrument. All of these things will help make you a well-rounded individual in general and give you so much in addition to your academics. For example, growing up in Dubai and Croatia, I played the piano, I played football. Those are my two main things. And then moving to England, I started playing the drums, which I always wanted to do, but my parents didn't want me banging in the house. So I joined a little band outside of school over the weekends. Then I also took up swimming and even coached younger kids, working from a small swim school on Tuesdays after school. And this gave me an early insight into working for money, managing time, and communicating with my employers and children's parents. These are both great experiences. Over the summers, I also windsurfed and I joined the Marine Cadets in England. And this got me into sailing, which now I do as a career over the summer, sailing yachts for very wealthy people. This is all not to brag, but to say that in your younger years, if you plant little seeds into hobbies over the years, they will grow and materialize into ways of making money and even careers. It's wonderful. You just have to put in the time. And I'm not saying spread yourself thin and do 15 things, but if you stick to a handful of extracurriculars that you actually care about, then you can really lean into those few things and they can take you in so many directions in life. Boring advice, sorry. But to stress, it's not a tangent. 
you can then, having said this, talk about all of these in your personal statement, and it can contextualize all of your academics if you spend time on other things in addition to school. A good example of this is a subscriber that recently reached out asking whether mentioning their YouTube channel with 30,000 subscribers as an extracurricular on their personal statement was worth talking about, to which I said 100% yes. For one, that's just something that's really unique, you know, not a lot of people do that. And two, it's obviously something that she's very passionate about because it takes time and energy and effort to build up a channel of that size. And three, it's honestly just an added bonus that success is literally quantifiable. Subscribers are not everything, but being able to say that she has 30,000 plus subscribers is very convenient. And I'm all about quantifying things. This also really goes for resumes with job applications, but we'll get into that in another video. I'd probably even add in how much revenue that channel generates each month. Like again, just quantify, quantify, quantify. And this example sort of highlights the importance of putting yourself in the shoes of the person reading your application. And this goes for all parts of the video and all parts of the application. Honestly, the admissions officers are getting application after application of very highly qualified students. And at some point, I would imagine that all of these applications kind of start to look the same. They start to just blend together. So think about the things that could really stand out for you. Now, you don't have to stand out necessarily by doing some exotic extracurricular that no one else does. You can totally stand out by holding a leadership role within that position and being able to quantify and show tangible things that you actually accomplished within that role. Because going back to the admissions officer, putting yourself in their shoes, the more specific and quantifiable it can be, the more it's going to stand out. And to tell you guys what I did, to give you some examples, I had a few main things that I really wanted to highlight in my application. So the first thing, I was a house captain, whatever that means, but it means some responsibility within school, which admissions officers understand. I also did the Young Enterprise Challenge. I was the sales director for that, which took some time every week and I also found some really cool work experience at Airbus Defense and Space which I then used to make a little TED Talk style presentation for my class about their new Mars rover. It's not mind-blowing stuff and it doesn't have to be but it's something that stands out and that shows that I really leaned into my passion for engineering and learning and just putting myself out there in general which by the way I'm not very comfortable with. I hated some of the more public things but sometimes you have to keep doing uncomfortable things because they're good for you. All right, so in conclusion for this section, I would recommend cutting out the things you don't care about in order to free up time for the handful of things that you do care about and put yourself in the shoes of the admissions officers who are reading through many, many applications. Think about how you can stand out amongst other applications when you describe your extracurriculars. All right, now for the final part of the admissions process after a very long tangent, and if you stayed long enough in the video to see this, you're in for a treat. The next component is the interview. So you've written the damn personal statement, you've got good A-level predictions, and your admission test went well enough. That's all it needs to be. It just needs to be good enough for the Oxford interview. Now, this offer comes and you're given a slot right before Christmas, incidentally, so you still cannot relax, but you have Christmas break to look forward to afterwards. Now, going into my interview, I had no clue on how to approach it, but now having done the interview and having helped hundreds of students just like you prepare for them through personal mentoring over the last four years, I'm pretty familiar with the process. And I'll say, if you're going to ask me what exactly they ask, no one knows. You'll get two interviews at least in, in two different colleges and they all do things differently. But my advice is have some things prepared. And just to note, mine was in person at St. John's College and Mansfield College at Oxford, but now they've all switched to being online. So as far as what usually happens in the interviews, there are usually two parts. The first is a brief introduction and some questions about why you want to study engineering, why you want to study at Oxford, just things like this. There are quite a few specifics that are a bit more complex than this, but I feel they deserve a whole video of their own. So if it's something you would like to see, just let me know in the comments below and I, I can make a separate video on this. All I will say is that this part should be muscle memory and having prepared answers, not necessarily memorized, but key points you want to hit and that they want to see is definitely a good thing. And it will put you at ease and make as part of the interview process a breeze. Next is the technical stuff, the maths and the physics questions. And these are probably going to be quite different to the style you've practiced in maths and physics at school because they really want to push you to your limits and get to see how far they can push you in your knowledge. There are some topics that they love to focus on, but again, it's not a science. All parts of your maths and physics should be strong, but just the style of questions will be different to what you've seen before. Now, this part definitely will need a separate video to go into the main topics that they focus on and like to ask about. But yeah, if you want to see this video, just let me know again. I just want to know that there's enough of you that care about this sort of stuff to see an entire video on it. But to summarize, the interview is very important. The first part about why engineering, why Oxford, things like this should be a breeze if you practice some answers and I can go through these some other time. And the technical part will be tough, but again, it's practicable. So no stress. Okay, to, to bring all this round and conclude this video, we went over predicted grades, the personal statement, the admissions exam, extracurriculars, and finally interviews. Now, despite my tough love and what might have sounded pessimistic with showing the statistics and just putting things into context, am I saying that if you don't fall within 
the range specified earlier, let's say for the admissions test, that you shouldn't apply to your dream college. No, I'm not saying that. Despite the statistics and probability of getting in, if you don't fall within that range, there are, of course, always exceptions to the rule and exceptions to everything that I've said today. I totally agree with that. The final hard truth is that regardless of how good of an applicant you are, it's still just a shot in the dark and that's fine. Some friends that were way better than me in school and got really good grades didn't even get interviews and some did and then some even didn't get into the union, some did. It honestly feels like the most random thing ever, which kind of sucks, but that's just how it works. And despite me having no idea of how I got in, this is just my story and my advice to myself four years ago if I were to do this whole process over again. And again, as I said, I have no idea how the process works or how I got in. And this is having graduated from Oxford Engineering this past September 2024. So some would say invaluable advice, but again, it's just advice. The overall university application process can be very stressful, especially if you're applying to many universities, especially if you're aiming at some of the more selective ones. And there's no way around it, unfortunately. But that being said, I will say that it feels very rewarding when you're done. So if you're in the thick of it, just know that having been through it and coming out the other side, it feels pretty damn good. So you have something to look forward to. All right, guys, that's all I got. I tried to include a lot, but also not say too much. If you have any remaining questions that I didn't get into, feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll try to get back to all of them. As I said, if you want to watch my video on the easiest formula to write an engineering person statement, I'll include it somewhere here. And if you want to watch my video, was the whole process of the four-year engineering degree at Oxford worth it? I'll include that here as well. But yeah, if you found this video useful, consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate it and it helps me make more of these videos. And if you're in the middle of the application process, good luck and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.